most famous air base in the world, but also the most mysterious. What is really being tested at Area 51? Experimental military airplanes? Or machines from other worlds? Now the speculation starts. This plane is being developed that's from alien technology. Just what is being flown in the Nevada desert? There are alien spacecraft and possibly alien beings at the S-4 location. Or is that just what they want you to believe? UFOs are a very handy smokescreen if you want to hide top secret stuff. Now we visit a mysterious crash site that may hold the answer. Yeah, that's it. That one, that's pretty damn close. Just what is going on in Area 51? There's nothing more dangerous than a place that doesn't exist. Beyond Area 51 on Unsolved History. Since the 1940s, there have been thousands of reported sightings of UFOs, unidentified flying objects. These mystifying and intriguing encounters have created a new geography of secrecy. And the center of this world is a desolate stretch of desert in Nevada called Area 51. Located approximately 100 miles northwest of Las Vegas, Area 51 is known by many names. Dreamland, Paradise Ranch, and Groom Lake. Officially, it doesn't even exist. But Area 51 has become one of the most famous place names in pop culture, inspiring movies, books, and TV shows. For this secret base is where our government tests the aircraft of the future, as well as, according to some, those from other worlds. How did Area 51 become associated with alien spacecraft? It all began with one man's incredible story. Although people in the know about secret aircraft programs had known of the existence of Area 51 for a while, it really achieved kind of notoriety and prominence during the early 1990s after the revelations of a guy called Bob Lazar, who claimed to have worked at Area 51 or a location nearby reverse engineering captured alien spacecraft. The antimatter reacting with matter produces the energy, uh, mainly heat energy, and that is converted into electrical energy by a thermionic generator. What he stated he was doing, he was hired on by the Navy to do reverse engineering on propulsion systems for alien spacecraft. Now he indicated he was in an area called S-4, which is an area that's about 15 miles from uh, the main facility, Area 51, and that in the uh, base of the, the mountain was a hangar complex that was actually built into the mountain, and they had nine spacecraft of different physical configurations, but all powered by the same power source. Although there was no way to corroborate Bob Lazar's story, it quickly caught the attention of the media. Now, whether you believe Lazar or not, it was this period really which kind of prompted hundreds, if not thousands of people to turn up there seeing what they could see. The tiny hamlet of Rachel, Nevada, just outside Area 51, became an unofficial meeting place for UFO watchers. Throughout the 1990s, thousands of tourists, UFO fanatics, and the just plain curious converged on this isolated corner of the Nevada desert. But Bob Lazar's claims have not convinced everyone. There is no evidence at all of any alien or extraterrestrial presence or involvement at Area 51. 
alien spacecraft housed in underground bunkers beneath the desert? Or are these reports of UFOs part of a cover story to obscure the truth? One of the best sources of keeping something classified is disinformation. The best way to do it is say it's, you know, is imply that it's a UFO, when in fact it was a man-built aircraft. To uncover the truth about Area 51, Unsolved History has assembled a team of investigators. Military aviation expert Nick Cook. Aviation author and historian James Goodall. UFO researcher Stan Gordon. And historian in residence Daniel Martinez. Together, they will revisit some of the most intriguing UFO sightings of recent years and separate the facts from the myths about Area 51. The history of Area 51 begins in the early days of the Cold War, when the United States and the Soviet Union were locked in a frantic arms race. Area 51, which included a dry lake bed known as Groom Lake, was one of several blocks of land carved out of the Nevada desert for testing atomic weapons. In the spring of 1955, grid number 51 was chosen to test another type of weapon. Area 51 came about largely thanks to the Lockheed Company, which was doing uh, a lot of secret work post the Second World War and needed a very remote and secure location to test its then top secret spy plane projects. Lockheed Aeronautics engineer Kelly Johnson enlisted a friend to help him find a suitable location to develop their new spy plane. Test pilot Tony Levere, the man who some say is the true father of Area 51. I told Kelly in simple words, I know exactly what you want and I'll get right with it, which I did. I'm searching for the perfect dry lake because I knew that a dry lake is the best natural landing field for experimental flying that ever was devised. When Levere and his team came across the area around Groom Lake, he knew he had found the spot. This thing is a on a scale of one to ten, it's a ten plus. The rest of them don't even stand a chance. Its location was really out in a godforsaken country. And uh, not very many people roam around those parts. Within a few weeks, Area 51 had become the U.S. government's most top secret test facility. The first project to be tested, the U-2 spy plane. Equipped with highly sensitive cameras and infrared sensors, the U-2 was capable of producing detailed aerial images of enemy installations from altitudes as high as 70,000 feet, far beyond the range of enemy radar. From the very beginning, the U-2 was a CIA-operated spy plane. And the way our government decided to cover the fact that it wasn't truly a spy plane, as they said it was for use for weather reconnaissance. For over four years, the U-2 flew dozens of missions over the USSR, gathering vital photographic information about the Soviet's military capabilities. But in May of 1960, the U-2 program came crashing to Earth. Secret reconnaissance of Russia by high-flying American U-2 jets ended when one was downed deep in Soviet territory. Its pilot, Francis Powers, was made the subject of a showcase trial. A Soviet court convicted Francis Gary Powers of spying and sentenced him to 10 years in prison. He was later exchanged for a Soviet agent, but U-2 flights over the USSR were ended. Although the U-2 incident was a severe setback for the U.S. government, the spy plane had provided invaluable information during the Cold War. Without images coming from the U-2s, we would not have known that the Soviet Union was moving intermediate-range ballistic missiles into Cuba. 
It proved what the Soviet Union had and what they didn't have prior to satellites coming into operation. But the U-2 was not the last secret plane to be tested at Area 51. After the U-2, a number of other secret spy plane projects were tested at Area 51. The next most demanding one technologically was another Lockheed program called the A-12, which was a CIA program for a very fast flying Mark III, that's three times the speed of sound, spy plane. The A-12 and its successor, the SR-71, became known as Blackbirds. Both could reach altitudes above 85,000 feet and cruise at 2,150 miles an hour. One of the reasons the Blackbird program was so secret is we didn't want the Soviet Union to know what we had the capabilities of doing. We had the ability on demand to overfly any airspace in the world as long as politics didn't get in the way. During this time, there were other aircraft being tested at Area 51. Strange objects in the skies above Groom Lake, alien spaceships, or secret military projects. Truth is stranger than fiction. Next on Unsolved History. Ironically, the very secrecy that surrounds Area 51 has created a fertile breeding ground for rumors of UFOs. The reason people are fascinated with Area 51 is the simple fact that the United States government, our government, which is paid by our taxes, uh, continues to deny the existence of Area 51. For years, amateur UFO watchers had reported sightings of strange, wedge-shaped objects cutting through the skies above Groom Lake. The mystique about Area 51 really started growing in the mid-1980s when there were a lot of spooky airplanes or spooky sightings in and around the Nevada test site. Word began to spread throughout the UFO community that these were alien spacecraft. The truth was nearly as surprising as the rumors an aircraft that defied belief. In the mid-1970s, a number of organizations, but principally Lockheed, got the idea that you could significantly reduce the radar cross-section of an aircraft down to the size of something approaching a small bird or even an insect. The name for this new technology was stealth, aircraft practically invisible to radar. The prototype for the stealth plane was codenamed Have Blue. The Have Blue design incorporated angled surfaces, or facets, to break up the radar reflection. A later program called Tacit Blue utilized smooth contour shapes for the same effect. Tacit Blue was a technology demonstrator developed by Northrop to prove that they could build and develop a low observable aircraft without faceting. It was a blended shape where they can control the shape precisely. The Have Blue and Tacit Blue projects evolved into America's most top secret aircraft to date. The B-2 Stealth Bomber and the F-117 Stealth Fighter. You have to bear in mind that here was an aircraft that was being tested and deployed in secret. It was vital that no one got to see it. The F-117 utilized special composite materials and faceted surfaces to absorb and deflect radar, enabling the plane to fly undetected. To a casual observer, the craft might indeed appear otherworldly. The first time I ever saw an F-117, I thought for sure the airplane was changing shape just because of the way it's faceted and the way the light was glinting off of it. And I just, uh, uh, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. If an untrained person saw an F-117 for the very first time and saw it head on, it would look like a flying saucer. And the thing about it, if you can't explain what it's up there, if you look at it up in the sky and you see something and you can't identify it, it's an unidentified flying object. 
In January 1991, the F-117, developed over years of secret flights in and around Area 51, was put to the test during the first Gulf War. The V-2 and the F-117 have since become vital components of American air power. Both planes saw action during the Bosnian conflict and again in 2003 during the invasion of Iraq. But as our military is called upon to fight a new kind of war, new weapons have been developed and tested at Area 51. Recently, we caught a glimpse of the future of warfare. Unmanned aircraft. In Afghanistan, the Air Force RQ-1 Predator, an unmanned aircraft equipped with surveillance cameras, scoured locations too dangerous for troops. Since then, the Predator has taken on an offensive role. Equipped with Hellfire missiles, unmanned assault aircraft will enable the soldier of the future to engage the enemy without placing himself or herself in harm's way. But are these planes the only types of experimental craft being developed at this remote base? For years there have been rumors that alien spacecraft have been reverse engineered at Groom Lake. Next, we go inside Area 51 on Unsolved History. The secrecy that surrounds Area 51 has created a subculture where nothing is too strange to be believed. Ironically, even though this base does not officially exist, it's probably the most famous airbase in the world, and you get a lot of people just turning up, wanting to know what's behind those hills. When you go to a place like Area 51, you have to be very mindful of what you're going to see because inevitably people go there with preconceptions. They see what they want to see when they're around Area 51. If you're a UFO nut, you're going to see a UFO. It's just one of those places. It, it's a place which engenders uh, fascination and it's a place that triggers the imagination. The curious who descend upon this remote location, however, will find it difficult to actually get that close to Area 51. The base itself is behind a range of mountains. There's a very discreet roadway leading up to the base. You could drive past it and you wouldn't notice that anything was there. But if you stray over a kind of invisible line where the security forces know you're getting too close for comfort, then security can swing into operation. There are signs when you get really close to the base telling you that those armed guards have the authority to use lethal force if required. There are helicopters which patrol the area and can flush out people in the desert if they get a little bit too close. There are all kinds of security cameras and sensors which warn the authorities of unwarranted approach. At one time, it was possible to get a look at the base by climbing the nearby mountains. But in 1995, the government withdrew access to public lands that surround the facility and declared the most popular observation points off-limits. Today, the day-to-day -day operations at Groom Lake are still cloaked in secrecy, though it is still a very active site. It's a facility that employs anywhere between 1,500 and 2,500 people on any given day. They have flights going out of uh, Palmdale, out of uh, McCarran International Airport in Las Vegas, and out of Hill Air Force Base. So you have people coming in from all directions. You have buses that go in there with workers every morning. It's a very, very busy place. Well, of course, if you work at Area 51, which is a base that does not exist, you have to be completely silent about your activities there. That's the whole point. You don't discuss these projects at all. You don't just discuss working on them. You don't discuss the existence of these programs. And that is essential. There is only so much you can see from the ground, but there is another perspective of Area 51. 
Global Security is a non-profit Virginia-based think tank that analyzes satellite images of military and industrial installations from around the world. We ask them to examine a satellite photo of Area 51 and evaluate the expansions and improvements that have occurred since 1968. You can see the change that's taken place to this base over this period of time. The most significant portion of this is the, um, the addition of the new runway right here. The original runway at Groom was 18,000 feet long, which is almost twice as long as a normal commercial international airport runway. And the reason for all that overrun is with the SR-71 test program, they want to have lots of extra space in case they lost the brakes or something went wrong. And you can see in the new image that there was an extension sometime in the 1970s or 80s. And then in the early 90s, an entirely new runway was built. This new runway is the longest in the world. Why has it been built at Area 51? Is it possible that it was designed to accommodate a new top secret spy plane? A plane the government claims does not exist. In 1991, there was a series of unexplained sonic booms in the Southern California area, literally shaking windows. Seismologists estimated that the aircraft that produced the booms were flying between Mach 3 and Mach 4 up to four times the speed of sound. During this period, there was also a dramatic surge in reports of strange-looking, fast-moving aircraft around Groom Lake. At the same time, the Air Force abruptly canceled the SR-71 Blackbird program. Was the SR-71 scrapped in order to make room for a more advanced replacement? Some people believe that a spy plane called Aurora replaced the SR-71. Uh, rumors have it that this aircraft was developed in secret, uh, was extremely high-flying, fast-flying. In the early 1990s, Aviation Weekly published reports of an aircraft observed in the night sky at extremely high altitude. Could this be the Aurora? Well, the Aurora is thought to fly as fast as 8,000 miles an hour, or about Mach 12. And an altitude is somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, between 150 and 225,000 feet. From Area 51 to New York City on an Aurora-type aircraft would be a matter of about 10 minutes. That's pretty fast. But to date, government officials insist that the Aurora is a myth and that the rumors about Aurora began with a misunderstood code name for a top secret budget account. All of a sudden, somebody sees an account called Aurora with hundreds of millions of dollars, if not a billion dollars. Wow, now the speculation starts. This plane is being developed that's from alien technology. The fact is that Aurora does not exist. There is absolutely no evidence that Aurora exists beyond some circumstantial evidence that the U.S. Air Force needs something to replace the SR-71 Blackbird. But others insist that the Aurora is real. According to James Goodall, Lockheed's Ben Rich indicated that there was in fact such a plane. Ben Rich was the, the retired president of the Lockheed Skunk Works. So he was a man in the know. I also had friends at Pratt & Whitney who confirmed that there was, in fact, uh, an Aurora-type aircraft had been flown along with a mother airplane. Uh, and it was designed for one reconnaissance, but also for verification of nuclear proliferation. We were not able to substantiate James Goodall's claims about these alleged statements. But whether it exists or not, the Aurora has enhanced the mystery and intrigue surrounding Groom Lake and Area 51. But is it possible that other secret aircraft from Area 51 may be responsible for a string of UFO sightings? When we return, strange triangular objects in the night sky. 
experimental aircraft or alien spacecraft next on unsolved history area 51 has long been associated with strange sightings in the sky is it possible that a secret project at area 51 could be responsible for reports of large triangular shaped ufos Beginning in 1989, thousands of witnesses in Belgium reported seeing a triangular craft with three bright white lights and a blinking red light in the center. A similar sighting occurred in Arizona on the night of March 13, 1997. A large V-shaped object was observed traveling on a southeasterly course over the state, passing over Phoenix at about 8.30 p.m. Although seen by hundreds of people throughout the state, only one known videotape exists of this phenomenon. It was shot by a retired pilot from the front yard of his home in Scottsdale, northeast of Phoenix. At about 8.28 that evening, uh, I was outside with my video camera and um, happened to, to look up, right about up in there, and saw a formation of lights moving from north to south. The V formation that flew over consisted of between five and six amber lights only, but it was totally silent, completely and totally silent. Although this is the only actual videotape of the formation, other witnesses throughout Arizona reported seeing the UFO that evening. Artist Tim Lee created this image of the strange craft that passed over his home in central Phoenix. The right arm of the object went directly over this house, over the property, and the left arm of, the, of that was probably about two and a half blocks over in that direction. So when it came over, it pretty much dominated this whole quarter of this little valley up here. Three years later, on January 5th, 2000, a similar event occurred in southern Illinois. Around 4 a.m., a series of calls began streaming into the regional 911 center in Belleville, approximately 18 miles southeast of St. Louis, Missouri. I just received a call from Highland PD, reference to a truck driver just stopped in and said there was a flying object in the area of Lebanon. It had white lights and red blinking lights and it was last seen southwest over Lebanon. All in all, six eyewitnesses, including four police officers, reported seeing a huge flying object. The witnesses' description of what they saw is not entirely consistent, but the predominance seems to be that they saw some sort of a triangular-shaped vehicle with really, really bright lights on it. Scott Air Force Base is located in the middle of the object's flight path. According to spokesmen, however, the UFO could not have been a military aircraft from Scott. Checking with our experts who work at airfield operations in the control tower, we found that uh, our airfield was closed during that time. Our control tower was closed, so there was no way that there could have been an aircraft operating in and out of Scott Air Force Base and that there was no military tie to this sighting. According to published reports, there was some speculation that the UFO was in fact a B-2 stealth bomber from Whiteman Air Force Base, over 200 miles away. But the B-2 bomber does not exhibit the flight characteristics described by the witnesses, such as the ability to hover. So what else could it have been? Is it possible that the object may have been a secret military aircraft, a so-called stealth blimp? There's been rumors for a long time about a stealth blimp, and Lockheed actually has a patent for a large triangular-shaped, low-observable, lighter-than-air craft. So some of the craft they've seen you know, could in fact be uh, one of these stealth blimps or stealth dirigibles. Some of them are really huge. Now, over Hampton, Virginia, in the 1980s, there was one they estimated was, was over 1,000 feet long. It was bigger than the aircraft carrier, but it made no noise.
But others are not convinced that these are just experimental military aircraft, especially when they perform maneuvers that defy belief. Just not enough evidence to convince me that it was um, tactical aircraft or something from another world. It's somewhere, it could be somewhere in between. I mean, there's just no way for me to know. The truth behind these strange flying objects remains a mystery. Whether they were optical illusions, experimental aircraft, or of an unexplained origin. When we return, a mysterious object crashes into a ravine in Pennsylvania. Could there be an Area 51 connection? Next on Unsolved History. That, that's it. Could a secret project at Area 51 be behind a famous UFO incident? According to newspaper accounts, on the evening of December 9th, 1965, hundreds of people in the United States and Canada reported seeing a brilliant fireball arcing across the sky. The Greensburg Tribune Review reported that several witnesses said that the fiery object crashed into a wooded ravine in western Pennsylvania near the hamlet of Kecksburg. Some residents, including William Beulah Bush, claimed to have seen the object that fell into the ravine. I went up there and I looked at it and I couldn't figure out what it was. It looked like an acorn to me, but yet it was a little longer. I'd say about as big as a Volkswagen, maybe a little bit longer than a Volkswagen, you know. And you could get at least two or three men in it. I mean, to set maybe too comfortable. According to published accounts, military personnel cordoned off the area. Some witnesses claimed the object was taken away on a flatbed truck. Saw this flatbed truck come out of the woods with this object on it. And I could see it. It was copperish looking, mm -hmm. had the hieroglyphics around the bottom of it, which was like a bumper shape, you know, it was rounded off. Like an acorn sitting on maybe a tower, you know, a big round tower. However, the military claimed that nothing was found in the woods that night. This was in line with the official explanation. Officially, it had now been declared that people had been mistaken. Nothing had fallen into the woods. People had seen a bright meteor in the sky, and that's how the report officially is as of today. But several witnesses claim to have seen the object, and their descriptions are remarkably consistent. What they describe basically is a large metallic acorn-shaped object that is approximately 10 to 12 feet or more in length and about 8 to 10 feet or so in diameter, semi-buried in the ground. Could this strange object, allegedly seen by dozens of people, have been a downed spacecraft? One of the most common explanations for the Kecksburg event has been the theory that it was Cosmos 96, which was a Russian spacecraft that was designed to land on the planet Venus. And during its mission, there was a, a problem and it re-entered Earth's atmosphere. The Cosmos 96 lander, however, fell to Earth more than 12 hours before the Kecksburg object. Cosmos 96 re-entered the Earth's atmosphere at about 3.18 a.m. that same date in Canada. Now, the event in Kecksburg happened about 4.47 in the afternoon. So, that being the case, we have to wonder more and more what exactly it was that may have fallen. Some have theorized that object might have been the engine or nacelle from an A-12 or SR-71 Blackbird, which had disintegrated during a test flight. The Unsolved History team decided to perform an experiment. First, we asked graphic designer Patrick Martin to prepare some renditions of various types of space debris, as if they had crashed into the ravine. In one drawing, he used the engine housing from an SR-71 as the object. In another, he substituted the image of the landing module from the Cosmos 96. Then, historian-in-residence Daniel Martinez showed the artist's renditions to some of the Kecksburg eyewitnesses. So I'm going to just give you these. I'm going to give you one by one. And you take as much time as you want to look at them and say, it either looked like this or it didn't look like this. 
First, Daniel shows William Beulah Bush some renditions of an SR-71 engine housing. Second one here for you. No. Nope. Here's another. No. Then he shows him the rendition of an SR-71 engine itself. Yeah, this is pretty close here. This didn't have the writing on the back. Okay. A little similar, but not exact. Yeah, this, it don't have, it's not in a point like, you know. Now this, this here is... A little bit closer. Oh, yeah. Next, Daniel showed the artist's renditions to witness Jerry Betters. I'm going to lay these artist impressions in front of you. I want you to look at them as long as you like and tell me what you see. No. Okay. Another one for you here. Closer. Closer? Okay, we'll put that in the closer pile. Here's another. Yeah. Yeah. That one. Okay, that's in the... That, that's it. If it, was, if it was upright, that would be it. That's pretty damn close, you know. Our eyewitness picked the Soviet space capsule as being the best match for the object he saw on the back of the flatbed truck in 1965. This would seem to eliminate the likelihood that the Kecksburg object was the engine from a Blackbird. To have a part of a Blackbird to uh, have crashed in Pennsylvania, uh, I'd have to say no, there's no way it could happen. But after looking at, at the illustrations, is it part of a satellite? Is it a part of an extraterrestrial uh, object? Very possible. But if it was a Soviet spacecraft, where would it have been taken? If some foreign aircraft, let's say a Soviet aircraft, had flown into the uh, United States and landed normally there, then it would be taken to a place like Area 51 for analysis and tests, because being a remote location, it would be an ideal place to test that aircraft. Four decades have passed, and the local residents still debate what, if anything, fell near Kecksburg that day. Now, of course, as a researcher, I'm continuing to look into the possibility that it could be other man-made projects that we don't have any knowledge of at this point. But we cannot eliminate the possibility that this object could be of extraterrestrial origin. We may never know the truth about the Kecksburg UFO, whether it was indeed a meteorite, a Soviet space probe, an SR-71 engine, an experimental military airplane, or, unlikely as it may seem, an alien spacecraft. Next on Unsolved History, the truth about alien UFOs at Groom Lake and what the future holds for Area 51. Area 51 is still an active military facility and the weapons of the future are still being developed and tested at this remote site. The last technology that we know was tested at Area 51 was essentially stealth technology. And we know that uh, testing has gone on to uh, kind of build a, it's almost like a Klingon cloaking device system to uh, make aircraft uh, more invisible to the human eye. One way you can make an aircraft less easy to spot with a naked eye is to coat it with a, an electrochromatic kind of polymer which effectively, when coupled to sensors, can tell the aircraft uh, what background it's flying against. So if you're on the ground and looking up, the sensors on the aircraft would register that the aeroplane is flying against a blue sky background. And so it will signal to the polymers below the aircraft that they should mimic the sky. So effectively what you're seeing is a chameleon-like thing that is flying through the air, shimmering a little like uh, the Predator in that movie. Oh, yeah. It's floating. Yeah, it does. It looks like it's floating, but it was crazy in shape. But what about the rumors of alien spacecraft being tested at Area 51? In recent years, Bob Lazar, the man who claimed to have worked at a location near Area 51, has withdrawn from public life. 
His stories about having reverse engineered alien spacecraft have largely been dismissed by government officials and the mainstream media. Lazar's credibility was broken down pretty bad. He never worked up there. He never worked for Los Alamos or in any of the labs in New Mexico. He might have been up there, but he didn't work for the government. He worked for maybe for a private contractor. But no one up there at Area 51 or any place in the labs acknowledges that any spaceship really existed. But some still defend Lazar's credibility. The question is, are there alien craft or alien beings at Area 51? Uh, the answer to that is no. But if you believe Bob Lazar, which I do, then there are alien spacecraft and possibly alien beings at the S-4 location, which is the southwest corner of the Papoose Range. In August 1997, after decades of denials, the CIA made a shocking admission thousands of UFOs reported by eyewitnesses were actually covert test and reconnaissance flights. UFOs are a very handy smokescreen if you want to hide top secret stuff behind them. And you don't get anywhere more top secret than Area 51. So the legends that surround Area 51 are going to be very handy for someone who wants to uh, engender a bit of disinformation to go and do a bit of spinning. Perfect. Still, some believers persist that the admission by the CIA is nothing more than their latest bit of disinformation intended to cover up the truth about Area 51. Why do they keep Area 51 a secret? Because they feel if they deny it enough, people will believe them and say it doesn't exist. It's the worst kept secret in the history of, of the United States government. And until they open the facility up to the media, the mystique will still stay there and people will still be wondering what's really at Area 51. Even now, the secrecy that surrounds Area 51 makes it difficult to separate fact from fiction. Well, the reasons why the government keeps Area 51 secret is something of a mystery to somebody like me. Um, I suppose from their perspective, you could say that so much secret stuff has been going on there for so long, it's very difficult for them to come out and say, we were lying. There is a base there. It's been there for ages. And by the way, there's an awful lot of secret technology stuff going on there too. Once you start to unravel that onion, who knows how many layers further you have to go. So I think it's kind of convenient to them just to keep quiet about it and downplay its existence. Bear in mind that this was a base that, for most of its existence, has not officially existed. But it is the most famous or infamous, and because of the, uh, because of the investment that the Air Force and other agencies have there, I suspect it will be in business for a very long time. For now, Area 51 remains a place shrouded in mystery. A place where reality is incredible, and the incredible is real a place where legends and myths are born.